Marker. <coughs> okay, so now, Charlie used to come to your house a lot. Tell me what yes. that was like what, and, and what your parents did and everything. What okay. Was it about? In 1929 yeah. is my first remembrance of Charlie. And we lived in the little town of Boynton, some probably an hour away from here. And um, he came to our house. Now, this is my first remembrance of him. He came to our house, and Mother was telling him about a family that lived out the edge of town that whose children didn't go to school because they didn't have any shoes. So he said, well, we'll fix that. I'll just go out there and give them some money. Mother said, well, if you're going to go, let's get them some groceries. So she gave me a grocery list and said, Ruth can show you the way. We went to a nearby grocery store that was run by a neighbor, a neighbor of ours. And um, we went over to the store. Charlie drove me over there. He stayed in the car, left the motor running, and, and obviously he would, you know. Now, as I look back, I went in the grocery store with the list and asked the man to fill it. He put it in a basket, which I think was probably about a half bushel basket. My memory wants to say it was a ba bushel, but I'm sure it was a half bushel. We, He took it out to the car, tipped his hat to Charlie, and Charlie did the same to him, gave him a signal of hi, and put the groceries in the back seat. I crawled in there and showed Charlie how to go out to their farmhouse because my mother and dad often played cards with these people, and I knew how to go. So when we got out there, these people have this farmhouse, you know, with a long front porch and the, some small pillars, big steps going up. And so Charlie gets out of the car, leaves his car running, yet he gets out of the car and puts the basket of groceries on the porch. And then he gave me a bill and put it in my hand, and he said, Dink, I was tiny then, he called me Dinky. But he said, Dink, give this man this bill and tell him to buy his children some shoes. I never did look at the bill. I wish I had so I'd know how much it was, what denomination. So he went back to the car. I knocked on the door, and the man came out and got the groceries, which I said, Mama sent you these, and, and, uh, and here's some money that Charlie said to buy you kids some shoes. I even told him that Charlie, did. of course, they knew who Charlie was, you know, knowing us, they would know. So why that, did people turn him in if they knew it was, it was, it was Pretty Boy Floyd, this, this outlaw? Well, right uh, people, I think, who turned him in, I don't know what their motive might have been, but maybe they just didn't get as big a slice of the pie, you know. But this family where we took the groceries to, uh, uh, they had a boy my age, and he hasn't hadn't been going to school, and that's how come us to know because it was winter time and it was cold. And this boy, I heard later, by talking to people at a class reunion, this boy went on to be superintendent of schools in the state of Kansas. Oh my goodness! So I think it it was a good it thing a that because mm -hmm, he was a very smart boy. What about some of those stories you about when Charlie would come to your house and the sheriff would, would come and try to yes. get him? Now, the story I just told you was 1929, mm -hmm. and when I mm -hmm. was nine years mm -hmm. old. Okay, in 1930, we moved to the Haskell area out in the country, but there was a big gasoline plant there, so it wasn't like moving on a farm where you plowed the ground and raised things. And on this um, uh, place where we lived, we had a three-car garage, a three-car. It was a company house that we lived in and was what they call the shotgun house where you could stand in the front door and look out the back, except that we had built onto the back. Well, Charlie would come there. My dad was a deputy sheriff under Sheriff Cannon in Muskogee, and Sheriff Cannon knew that Charlie was related to us, and Dad told him, said, you know I'll never turn him in, and he said, I know, but I know you won't, and I don't ask you to, but but I have the liberty of coming out any time I get ready. And Dad said, you certainly may. You may come out any time you get ready. And he did several times. One particular time, I was out on the front porch when Sheriff Cannon came in. All of us kids knew him, you know, just like a neighbor, because he was there so much, even prior to Charlie coming there. And I was standing on the front porch and saw the taillights of Charlie's car going down the road. And I think sometimes really 
kind of knew, but just wanted to, you know, be doing his duty of seeing about things. One time, though, he did come, and Charlie was out in a tall cotton field. There was some black people who lived by us, very fine black people, and very friendly with the family. And he hid in their tall cotton until they left. But Adam Richity was with him that time, that particular time. Now, he promised my mother, Charlie promised my mother, he said, Tempe, I will never fire a gun in your house if they have to kill me or take me alive. I will never do it. But he would come to our house, say, for instance, uh, one particular time I'll tell about, uh, he had come from Morris. He'd robbed the Morris Bank. Well, uh, I'm going back because I found this out later, see. But he drove in, and when he drove by the house and to the garage, my dad said, well, there's Chuck, because he was the only one who ever drove on around and pulled his car into the garage out of sight. And he and Adam Richty were together. And uh, they came in. My mother had one of the old antique, what's now antique dining room tables, the big round oak table, huge one, with a big family, have to have a big table. But they all sat, Dad and Mother and Adam and Charlie were all sitting around the table having coffee. And, and he had some sacks canvas sacks sitting on the table. So I go in, you know, and I am open up one. Here's it's full of dimes, and I'm going like this, you know. I'm stringing my fingers through the dimes, you know. And he said, Dink, go out to the car. I've left you and Frankie, my next younger sister. I've left you and Frankie some money in the car. You can have all the money you can find. So, of course, this was a ritual with us when he came but he would take money and throw it all through the car, and we'd gather it up, and that was all ours. And, of course, what they wanted to do was get rid of us kids so they could all talk about what he had been doing. But uh, in Mike Wallace's book, he has a picture of my dad mm -hmm. with Charlie. Mm -hmm. I took that picture. Now, that was just before Charlie went to Ohio. And in this particular, at this particular time, it, in the picture, when you see the actual picture, you can see the mark where the gun is under his clothes. But my dad, they'd had it out looking at it, and my dad said, Charlie, what's all these notches for? Is that for the people you've killed? And he said, no, no, Jess, it's, uh, those notches stand for every time I robbed the Morris Bank. He hated the Morris Bank because they wouldn't make him a loan in the very beginning to buy Ruby a ring. And so he had it in for him, and he robbed yes. them every chance he got. Mm -hmm. And they knew it, and I don't know why they didn't take precaution. But how did you that kids, was... How did your kids feel about this, this way that he was always getting away from the sheriff? Did it make you... Was, was it, were you kind of proud? Did you feel like you were protecting him? Or No, you know, it was an everyday thing with us. We didn't even... I didn't even think... Uh, that was anything to talk about, except that my parents did tell us kids, do not talk about it at school. Do not tell the children that Charlie's here. Mm -hmm. We think a neighbor up the street may have turned us in at one time, but why, we didn't know, because he never bothered them. Mm -hmm. And no, we really, uh, personally, anyway, I had no particular feeling one way or another. I didn't think, well, now, Charlie, you shouldn't come here, you know. You're putting our family in danger. I don't know. Maybe I was too naive at the time, and but I was still a, a rather serious person at that young age, more serious than a lot of kids are, you know, at that age. Did you, did you um, hear stories about other folks who maybe weren't family who would help hide them out? Did you oh, hear yes. those stories? Oh, yeah. yes. And we often kept Jackie, or Dempsey is his real name, we often kept Jackie while Ruby would go with him, and sometimes. Can you just say that again and make it a little clearer about we kept Jackie while Ruby would go see Charles? Just oh, so, okay. So we, we, yeah. When we lived there in the long house, sometimes Ruby would come and she would be there with Jackie, before Charlie ever got there, and then when, when Charlie got ready to leave, he'd take Ruby with him, and we kept Jackie there. See. Uh, and Jackie was accustomed to it. He'd just soon stay at our house because there was a bunch of kids to play with, you know. But 
And there's so then, then Ruby and, and Charles would go off and they'd be protected someplace? Else? Yes, or um, I remember one particular time, I don't know where Dad, Dad had made the arrangements for them to stay somewhere and these people were gone, but he had made the arrangements because Dad had to drive ahead of him and show him where to go. I recall that, but that's all I remember about that. I mean, I wasn't made aware of it. It isn't a matter of remembering, it's just I wasn't made aware of it. Uh, one particular... You know what, we're just gonna run out of film. You are like... We're changing to new camera roll. Um, 312-7, or oh, the last one, no, the last camera roll was 312-7, uh, new camera roll is 312-8, Ruth Ring Morgan, take two. I guess, an Indian teacher I had, and seeing the people lined up with their tin cups to get soup. Marker. Okay. What? Can you tell me a little bit about how your own family got by during the Depression? During the Depression? Yeah. What, what was your mom doing? What was your dad doing? Okay. My dad was working for, I'll have to say the oil fields because I don't recall that man's name now, but he worked uh, in oil field related a job for one whole year, did not get paid a penny. But my mother was a good seamstress and she sewed for a lady who lived across the street and up a little ways. Their name, I believe, was Nafi. I think they were Syrian people because she made this real thin bread where they do it like this, you know. And I always wanted to be there when she made the bread. Well, her husband is the one who had the grocery store that I took the list to. And mother sewed in exchange for groceries. And I don't recall where she got fabric, but she made our clothes. She made our dresses and everything. She's a good seamstress. And while we lived in this little house there in Boynton, there was an elderly gentleman lived behind us, a feeble old man. I'll have to put feeble, I'm not sure of his age. But he lived in a little, a smaller house behind us, and he had a milk cow, and he was unable to milk this cow. So mother, having been raised out on a acreage, uh, she knew how to milk a cow. She milked the cow. She shared the milk with him, and, and the family got the rest of it. And every time she prepared a meal, she took food to him or sent me or sent my older brother down there with a plate of food for him. So my mother was always the sharing kind. And then I had a cousin who lived out at the edge of town and they had blackberries. And this cousin would make blackberry jelly and jams and she kept us furnished in that and plum, you know, so, okay, we had lots of biscuits and gravy and jellies and jams and didn't even know we were poor. <laughs> so was but, that the way a lot of people did, do you think? Oh, was yes. Like families I'm pulling sorry, together? Yes, it was, okay. families, it was families pulling together. We just have a little camera problem. problem. This is uh, Ruth Wing Morgan, take three. Mark. Marker. So I was just going to ask you, did people, families, and people share and trade a lot? Is that yes. how you saw people y getting by? That's exactly right. And uh, during the winter time, talking about depression, okay, we had shoes, but I recall I wore tennis shoes to school. Now, they were not the little loafers. They were the lace-up shoes. And in school, we had the big... Um, heaters, uh, steam heaters, or whatever they were. And I, I would walk to school, which was about two blocks, and in the snow with my tennis shoes on. Then I'd take my shoes off, put them up on the heater, and mine weren't the only ones there. Everybody dried their shoes. I walked back at lunchtime, and this re was repeated all the time. So uh, a lot of people were in that position. But in 1930, when we were at, in the Haskell area and Charlie came there, uh, he gave, uh, you know, with the money that we'd get, I could buy shoes and they were a dollar and a half a pair. And that was the nicest shoes you could buy, you know. Mm -hmm. And so he helped our family a lot, but we weren't the only family. There's numerous people that you could go all over Oklahoma and they'd say, yes, Charlie came by our house and he brought so-and-so or he gave us some money for groceries and 
So he really didn't spend all that money that he robbed. To him, I think it began to be a game in the beginning, and then it got more serious, you know. One particular story when we lived at Haskell, it would have been uh, just before, not not immediately, but a year or two before he went to Ohio, where he was killed. He was lying on our bed and had his machine gun by him and was asleep, and he was lying on top of the covers, and he had a bullet in his ankle. His ankle was kind of swollen. Mother had been putting something on it, and she did call the doctor, and the doctor, our doctor came out and saw after him. The details on that I don't recall, but he was lying on the bed, and I just wanted to touch that gun so bad. And I reached over and just put, barely put my fingers on it, and he shot up like a target, I mean a bullet. And he said, Dink, don't ever do that when Uncle Charlie's asleep. You wait. When we go down to the farm, my dad owned a farm down by McAllister. When we go down to the farm, I'll let you shoot that gun. We'll have to hold it for you. And I did. I got to shoot that machine gun. <laughs> but those were just little stories, you know, in between. And why he was... Think, why do you think he became a bank robber? Uh, well, he wanted some money because Ruby was dating an Indian guy. And he wanted Ruby. He didn't want Ruby to marry this Indian guy. You know, he he wanted her to marry her himself. Had he had a hard time making money working? Had he tried? Do you know stories about I, that? No, I really don't. Mm -hmm. And and I'm sure I've heard them. Mm -hmm. I'm sure my dad, mm -hmm. you know, uh, has told them. In fact, I remember them talking about it, but I don't recall, uh -huh. even after in my older age, because by then... He was gone. It was old hat, and I didn't register a lot of this stuff. My mind was already preoccupied with other things. Did he think? Did, did you ever think of him as a kind of a Robin Hood? Did you ever think about him that way? Uh, not really, but he was in a way. He, in a sense, he was. But I can tell you one thing: he loved his family, and he loved Jackie, and that was the, the height of his glory was to get to come there and, that and baking apple pies. <laughs> Man, one story about the apple pie thing, when we lived in the long shotgun house on the end where they'd built this room on and, and they had a canvas cover around it, like a covered back porch. They had, that was the kitchen. And Charlie was out there and making pies, you know, and everything. And he made a pie for my sister to take to the pie supper. Now, I went to the pie supper, but he made the pie for her to take to the pie supper an apple pie and and it uh, and another time Charlie was there and he had just left that was the time I saw the lights going down the street and there's a guy that lives over here at um, Bixby he, a cousin of mine uh, Tom and Jess Tom is the lady we just nickname but he looked so much to me like Charlie when he was young and he was there with his wife and so was Jackie there, but Ruby wasn't there. She had left with Charlie. And he heard someone out in the kitchen, uh, Cannon did when he came in, Sheriff Cannon, went back to the kitchen, and it was uh, Jess Hargrave uh, popping popcorn. And he just knew he'd caught <laughs> Charlie. <laughs> But there are lots of little stories like that as mm -hmm. they come to mind. Mm -hmm. Did you, but, something that you mentioned, um, and I know I read about it in, in, in Mike Wallace's book too, was that Ruby and Dempsey sometimes went to theaters and spoke about Pretty yes. Boy. Did you ever see that? What oh, that? yes. Like, what, what, what did they do? Um, well, she was uh, advocating, uh, uh, well, they had been in Dallas, I believe it was, and Jackie had been baptized there or whatever, and they, when they came to our home there at the, in the Haskell area, uh, she went over to Muskogee in a theater and gave this uh, talk, you know, about how we shouldn't do this and that and everything, and then Jackie had his little spiel, and, you know, a kid like, you know, I was, what, 13 or 14 or something, I don't remember, right offhand, a young girl. You know, that, to me it was just more fun to see everything else going on than to pay attention to that. 
But my brother's wife, if she hasn't destroyed it, and I've promised it to Mike if I can get my hands on it, has a poster that was in that theater over there. Now, I remember Jackie being all dressed up in the little white suit and everything, and they were, you know, talking to the crowd about it. So they but do you that? know how I got to hmm. Muskogee? Charlie took me. So do you, would they talk about crime and yes. being a bank robber? What, yes. What kinds of things would they say? Don't do it. You know, I mean, she was saying it isn't good. So and I understand, and Jackie can tell you for sure, but I just heard this over the gra family grapevine, that uh, Dempsey or Jackie uh, gave similar talks after he lived in the Frisco area. So do you think it was like a burden on the family that they were trying to, were they trying to? No, I think she was making money. I'm just <laughs> going to be real honest. I think she's making money. And she was making money. Okay. But I remember the ride over there. I thought that was the fastest ride I had ever been. I guess I would feel now like I, if I got on a space shuttle, you know, took off. Because I thought that was a... And he just dropped me off at the theater. Okay. This is great. I just wanted to, I wanted to know if... Yeah. yeah. First, Ruth Wing Morgan, take four. Marker. Okay, now just... Kind of in a short version, can you tell me about how, how your mom wanted you and Charlie to go get this groceries for the family? What happened? Oh, yes. Uh, well, of course, he was in the house, and he'd come in and sat down. I didn't tell you this before, but he'd come in and sit down, and Mother served him biscuits and jelly and coffee, and, and w they just got talking about this, and Mother said, well, they, this family out there really needs some help. You know, the kids don't even have shoes to go to school. And he said, well, why don't... Let's get some groceries, or mother said that. They agreed together they were going to get groceries. So they, mother said, well, Ruth knows the way. And she had smaller children, see. So Ruth knows the way. She can go with you. Now, mother trusted me to go with Charlie, see, even though he was a wanted person. So she knew that he would see that I was safe. And so she gave me, wrote me out a grocery list, and I didn't fill it. I took it in and asked the grocer that Mama said to fill this, you know, we want these groceries. He filled the thing, took it out to the car. Oh, oops. Yes, yes. It, end of the sound roll. Sounds sweet. Work. Okay, so you tell me that story. Then. Okay, uh, when we lived there in Boynton, 1929, there was a family that lived out the edge of town who's, who didn't have enough money to buy shoes for the kids to go to school, and they had a boy my age. Well, Charlie came to the house, and he and Mother decided between them that they need to take some groceries out there and some money for those people, because they lived on a farm, and in the wintertime, you know, farming back in Depression times, you know, they had practically nothing, and they had three or four children, I know, so Mother gave me a grocery list, and we go to the little grocery store around the corner from our house. I believe their name was Nafee. I think it was Nafee's Grocery. And this man knew that we knew Charlie. And Mother sent the list in by me. I, I took the list in. Just Charlie and I left went to the store. And I took the list in. He filled it, put it in a basket, and carried it out to the car, tipped his hand to Charlie, and Charlie did the same to him. Charlie had the car running all the time. He never shut the car down. And I'm sure it wasn't because it wasn't working mechanically. But anyway, we got in the car, and I showed Charlie how to go out there. We went out to the house, and it was a, one of these farmhouses has a long porch, and you have to walk up a few steps to get to it, uh, to get up to the porch. And so Charlie carried the groceries and just set them. It was I remember, can just see him today, setting that basket up on that porch. So it was man height, you know, to even with his arms, the porch was. And then he folded a bill in my hand. And he said, now, Dink, give, when you uh, knock on the door, said, give this to the man and tell him to buy his kids some shoes, or his children, however he said it. And I did. And the man thanked me, and I told him that, Mother sent him the groceries, and and he thanked me and took them in the house. And I didn't go in. I stood at the door, 
And I remember saying hi to one of the kids, but then I went on back to the car because it was cold and you didn't want to just stand around. That's a and, wonderful story. and I just piled in the front seat with Charlie and here we went, he takes me back home. So tell it's, me some, now can you, to thinking about those depression times, tell, <coughs> excuse tell me. me again how, how, how your family made it, mm -hmm. what, what your mom had to do and yeah. your dad. And of course she sewed and for groceries from this same little grocery can you store. Can start again and say my mom? Instead yeah, of she, yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, my mother um, sewed, was a good seamstress, and she sewed for this Mrs. Nafee, who who was the wife of the store owner where we bought groceries, and she exchanged that for groceries. And, of course, when the Depression really hit hard, we were already built up in clothes, you know, because Dad had had a pretty decent job, and we had plenty of clothes and different hand-me-downs, you know, the smaller children. And when you have seven girls and the oldest child is a boy, then all the girls can hand me down. You know, it isn't like you have a boy and a girl and a boy and a girl. So we made it fine on clothing. And then um, I had a cousin who lived at the edge of town and she and her family uh, all had blackberries and plums and things like that. And they they weren't hurting for money. They were cattle raisers and probably rustlers, too, if the truth were known. He later became an owner of the Fort Smith Stockyards, so he's very interested in cattle. All of mother's brothers were. And she would make this jelly and stuff. And, bring over. and once in a while, when they'd butcher a hog, a pig, whatever you want to call it, they would bring over meats like that. And, of course, that really made the gravy a lot better, you know. But I recall one particular time, and I don't remember whether Dad was driving me or, well, yes, Dad was driving me too. And we saw a lot of people, you know, a lot of people. And my dad told me, he said, Ruth, one of these days this town is going to have a riot. They later did. But... Another time, to a little story that I remember, was walking home from school with a teacher and seeing uh, people with cups, uh, tin cups, because if you, I can take you down there now, and from school to my house, you, you didn't have to, but it was more convenient to walk through a portion of the town, and that's where they fed the hungry. I don't know whether it was an organization or whether just people got together because people did feed anybody that came along hungry. My mother fed every bum that knocked at the door, even in Boynton and even more so in 1930 and 31 when we were living in the Haskell area, which is real close to Boynton. You know, it's real close. But um, bums would come to so the door and she, she would invite them in. You know, there wasn't any AIDS to be afraid of then, you know, or anything else, you know. And she'd invite them in. So I don't, it was just charity was kind of on a one-person basis? Yes. Yes, we didn't have, if we had charity, we had the uh, Red Cross, and I'm sure they probably did some good. Uh, I don't know the extent of that, but I do know that it was neighbor to neighbor and people to people. We... Uh, we lived in the country in the Haskell area in the 1930s, and even though you're not on a farm per se, you know, where you plow the fields and raise things, my mother and dad always had a garden, and they were managers. And, and I just thank the good Lord in heaven because my mother taught me how to manage. Uh, I may not have a lot, but I'm living, and, and you can't take a penny of it with you when you go. And she's taught me those things and said you can be anything you want to be if you want to be it bad enough. That's wonderful. So. Okay.